everybody. Um, delighted to be back here again. Thank you so much for inviting me back, and thank you, Lady Robot, for my intro. To start off, this is a quick snapshot of me um, and my life and my background. Um, I have a, a PhD that's at the intersection of interaction design, robotics, and smart materials, which somehow lends you into fashion, obviously, Ro <laughs> robotic textiles, et cetera. And I've spent uh, my time since then working with a lot of startups in the fashion tech space, being a translator, early wearables work, big uh, companies like Intel and Google, um, and now moving much more into the sustainable materials area. Um, so. As we understand it, <laughs> fashion is definitely an industry in transition. And when we think about transition dynamics, basically what we have is an old regime that's being pushed out. It's been optimized to a, a place where there's nowhere to go. And you have new systems of experimentation coming in place. So this is a really uncomfortable dynamic time, which is also a good time for massive opportunity. Um, and part of this is coming from the development of the fourth industrial revolution. And we are basically at this place where we have physical, digital, and the biological all merging um, into new technologies, and that's creating uh, lots of massive opportunities for fashion, uh, most directly in the space of materials, which is what I'll be talking about more, but also in terms of how we understand uh, the digital presence and the realms of AI, some of which you've heard already this morning. So one of the biggest things about moving the fashion system forward is to think about the circular economy and how do we get from what right now is basically a linear economy with a little bit of recycling going on um, into something that is really, truly circular. Um, so what are the kind of steps that we can think about towards this, uh, this, this uh, quest for circular fashion, for a circular fashion system? The technology and material development, which we'll be hearing a lot more about, but then we also have business models and consumer behavior and relationships. So things like rental services, all different ways to think about how we produce and use clothes. Um, and then value chain models and partnerships with radical transparency. So really this is about collaboration. How can, in order to change things, we have to work together. The big brands have to talk to each other and work together. They have to talk to the startups. And this is really something that the industry has to do together. So this is a nice sort of simple type diagram, but really when you start to dig into it, it looks a lot more like this. This is very hard to do. This is from uh, the MacArthur Foundation study, recent study. And, um, and this complexity is, I think, where we're going to dig into different, different sectors of the industry. Why are things so hard to get done? I always get asked, <laughs> why are things taking so long? And, th and this is sort of part of it. Um, so the other thing is, I've come from pure tech, I was at MIT, and one of the reasons I kind of am now in the space of sustainability is I was very disturbed by all of the e-waste. I was in the, in the building of the MIT Media Lab, there's, I don't know, about 50 computers per every human, and just seeing what gets thrown away and that kind of waste. And inside of the textile industry, we know, you know, we know that it's the second largest polluter, and so we have to be thinking about technologies that help us to optimize sustainability, and that they're not at odds with each other, which is oftentimes how the world sees them. The Luddite fallacy, so there's so much discussion, this is, this is sort of a pet peeve of mine, the robots are gonna take all the jobs. Okay, that's not happening. <laughs> First of all, anybody who makes robots is like, that's way too hard, it's not gonna happen anytime soon. But people don't realize that uh, the actual original Luddites were fighting against machine technology that is now completely commonplace. We're talking about um, textile mills, right? So this is now something that we would never consider um, technology in a sense that somebody, everybody should go back to hand weaving and hand sewing and not using sewing machines. So we're just at this different influx where robotics are the next version of, of a textile mill, right? So this is the, the evolution of this and we need to kind of get out of that Luddite mindset and think about how robotics and humans can work better together. So I'm going to now talk about what I do at the Future Tech Lab and, um, and really it's about building a sustainable material culture for the fashion industry. And I think about this and kind of go, go after it in three ways. It's, there's different kind of sections of, of what's going on in the industry. Um, there is uh, startups and materials that are using reclaimed methods and recycled methods. There's new methods being produced as bio, uh, new materials being produced as biomaterials. And then there's this sort of the, mer the, the transition into what I think of as advanced and active materials, which is where we start to think about getting into interactivity and wearables. Um, now, at the Future Tech Lab, we are part um, investment fund, part agency, and part brand. 
And a lot of what I do is, is actually um, run, try to find all of the most innovative startups in the space. And here are some of the ones that we're working with in various forms. We also try to create partnerships as well with bigger brands and be a general kind of uh, bridge builder inside of the fashion industry. So this area of recycling, different, different companies doing different things. You could think that these companies are at odds with each other, but really, W their, their real competition is traditional fashion companies, and we, tr we try to think about building the industry um, together. So different technologies doing similar things actually validates the space and moves everything forward for everyone. This is a collaboration idea. So Evernew working on recycled cotton, Warren again working on recycled polyester, Awesome Tech's working on mix through a mechanical um, breakdown process. Um, one of the, our first investments, investments was with Orange Fiber, and they transform the waste of the citrus industry, um, basically the peels of oranges, into a beautiful sustainable fabric. And we helped them put together a partnership with Ferragamo, which um, the collection launched in the fall um, and, uh, and sold out immediately. So this was a kind of a good story of success where you can have a startup working with a big luxury brand and have something positive happen for change. Um, this idea of reclaim, um, and there's you know, tons and tons of media going on about what is going on with our oceans. It's really a disaster, and this is a particular a personal value to me because I grew up on the beach in Southern California. And, um, and so this is a, a project from Parlay for the Ocean with Adidas, where it's reclaimed plastic, which is from, the, from ocean bottles, um, being turned into shoes. And what's amazing is Adidas has committed to um, a, a huge amount of investment in this space, and there, this is not a sort of capsule collection of a few hundred shoes. I think the figure right now is that they've sold over three million of these, and by the end of the year, they're going for ten or, or something in that range. So this is this is a true transition of a big brand committing to using um, a reclaimed yarn. Mango Materials is another uh, company that is looking at a reclaim method. This one reclaiming methane gas, which is basically cow farts. And um, this is actually a really big problem, the pollution from the meat industry. Um, and so basically they're turning this into a new bioplastic, which also can be a fiber. So this is literally taking gas out of the air and making a fiber out of it. Um, and even, as, and this is you know, basically the way that they do it, is in a process of synthetic biology, which is what a lot of these biofabrication and biomaterials come from, where they're feeding the methane to, um, to the microbes, using it as basically food for a microorganism, and the microorganisms then excrete what is this, this biopolymer. So this is a new fabrication method which is very sustainable. Um, another thing that's uh, potentially even more amazing, this is actually using directly converting CO2, so the waste product that we're all trying to get rid of, the excess CO2 carbon in the world, um, and with a proprietary catalyst, um, turning that into a polyurethane, which in this case is used for the soles of the shoes, um, for this pair of shoes. So they, we call them the footprintless shoe from 10X Beta. Now, interestingly enough, this prototype pair of shoes cost $30,000 to make. <laughs> and we'll get into the economics of some of these things and why the things aren't happening faster. But there's no reason why this can't come down in cost. But I think that when we think about a lot of these startups and a lot of these new technologies, um, we're not looking, you know, we, they're much closer to uh, something like getting a new drug on the market or, uh, you know, a biotech type startup than it is to say a digital startup. We can't expect the speed of development and necessarily the, the rate of return um, in the, in the same kind of time frame. And so this is a big issue within the startup community in terms of investment. Um, this is a project from Duma Lab, which is literally a, um, using the waste of shrimp shells, so the chitosin, turning it into a 3D printed subs a, a material that you can 3D print and get different qualities of, of brittleness and softness. And this can be used for things like packaging and plastic bags. And what's so beautifully poetic to me about this is that you literally, um, it, the, the, the way that this product dissolves is in salt water. So what usually happens with plastic is when you put it in the ocean, it's, it's a big contaminant, but actually putting it back in the ocean is the way that you biodegrade it. Um, uh, then, okay, the evolution of the leather industry is a huge, huge uh, area and, um, you know, one of the biggest problems of fashion, both from, both from the raising of the animals and from the toxins of the tannings. And there's several different startups that are working on this program, uh, uh, this area of research, and it could be things they're looking at actually using bovine cells grown in labs, um, like Vitra Labs, or MicoWorks, which is a mycelium-based leather. It's made from the root structure of mushrooms. Um, and another a company in this space, Modern Meadow, 
which has created an entire leather as, as a liquid, which is an entirely new way to even think about leather as a material. Because you, know, you now can think about, okay, I can cast leather, I can composite it, I can embed it. It's just, it, it sort of changes the whole idea that we have behind you know, what leather is and what it can be. It can be three-dimensional in various ways. So that's also another th exciting thing that the idea of biofabrication gives us around the material space. Um, Bolt Threads is a company that's creating lab-grown spider silk. Again, doing it through the same process of uh, synthetic biology. Take the DNA out of spiders, put it into yeast cells, and their process is actually much more akin to, to a brewery. This does not look like a fashion factory, does it? Uh, so this yeast, they literally feed sugar to the yeast and it creates liquid silk protein, which is then extruded. Um, and this is, you know, again, um, going into their laboratory, this is, it's a, it's a hugely different, it's a shift, a transition in what we think of as, you know, where, where, are, where is manufacturing happening now in fashion, right? This is a, a totally new world. Um, and I'll let, Stella McCartney has been working with both threads on a collection, and I will let her this talk about that. Is, this material is truly modern because it basically is. It's the starting point of where we're going to go in the future of fashion. You know, this is... This has never been done before. This is the absolute beginning of, of a new journey. And I think that, you know, I've always worked in fashion and respected the, the codes of history when it comes to sourcing the yarns and respecting nature and respecting the things that, that you know, the planet has given us. You know, you look at silk and you look at the worm and you look at the spider and you turn to these incredible resources and, and you respect them and they provide you with the material you can use and create fashion out of. And this is just the beginning of, of, of technology meeting that, that history in a sense. This is a brand new way to access a yarn that has, you know, it's, it's incredible the fusion between respecting nature and what it can bring to you and then growing it in, in a lab and using innovation and technology to, to actually protect nature in a sense. For me, it's so amazing when I went to San Francisco to Bolt Threads and I touched this yarn and I could see in my head how I could design an end result with this material and then bringing it back to London and, and showing it to my designers. And, and you know, it's just mind blowing for, for someone in my industry to work with a material that is grown in a laboratory. It's incredible. And then to see how we can design and how we can make that into something that translates into, into fashion for something like MoMA is just truly thrilling. Okay, and uh, another uh, example of using uh, synthetic biology, this time for the dyeing industry, so sampling DNA from different naturally occurring plants, so this is natural dye, but growing it in a lab by uh, splicing that DNA into a microorganism again. So you're not using as many resources, land, water, et cetera. Um, and even to the, we're even to the point where this is the hottest tech, fashion tech, I mean, biotech startup of last year is a company that actually grows micro, creates micro, custom microorganisms to grow other things. So they're literally biology by design firms. So this is the meta firm that you go to to get your, um, your, you know, your, your uh, bacteria that can, can make you silk. So that's a whole transition in itself. Uh, this is what their offices look like. Um, and then just a couple more uh, fabrics of, of, of thinking about this convergence of biology this, uh, and textiles. This is a project that, it, a, a fabric that actually breathes. There's a biospore that is embedded, has been 3D printed into this textile. And when you sweat, uh, it activates it. It's like a, the, the biospore is living in stasis, so it's alive but frozen, basically. Um, so this is like a living, breathing fabric. Um, other ways to think about how we utilize 3D printing, this is biofur, which is down literally to the micron where you can control all different things about how it behaves. So just using new technologies in these ways, an alternative. Now, I'm not going to get into wearables because I think what I would like to say is wearables are dead, long live wearables, but what they really are becoming and always were meant to be is smart fabrics. And so this evolution of how do we have interactivity on our bodies, it's coming. It didn't die with the gadget. It's just transforming itself into something that actually makes more sense for fashion and for our bodies and for interactivity. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to speed through this. But I think we've probably all heard of Google Project Jacquard, of this like innovation that actually integrates real conductive threads to have interactivity truly in the textile. Um, and other innovations in the space, like these, um, a lot of it for medical use, the body bio stamp. 
Um, and then this whole notion of actually fibers being parts of the circuit. So literally you have transistors and resistors and all these things that make up a printed circuit board, those being turned into actual uh, fibers themselves, so that literally a circuit will get woven. It's, hard, it's conceptually hard to think about, um, but, but, but that's a whole new design area that's being run out of the FOA Center at MIT, um, using RFID threads in products and fashion um, to be able to track and manage their supply chain and logistics. Um, again, this is RFID, NFC. Um, again, all of these new, new technologies, new materials that are adding to, um, to what we can do with interactivity, uh, new uh, flexible soft batteries, a huge thing powering anything is of course for any, for any form of interactivity that's always the bulkiest, hardest part. Um, and there's work going into fiber batteries. This was an amazing kind of evolution from Dan Steingart, solar fibers. Um, and then this is a new solar bead from Svelar and um, Pauline Van Donga's made this backpack. What's lovely about this is you can't tell where the solar cells are. It finally can be beautiful. It looks like tiny beads or sequins. And this is truly opening up doors for fashion um, to be able to store the charge. So last point, sustainable wearables, are they an oxymoron, <laughs> right? Because all of these things, damaging uh, metals and, and all these you know, materials that are highly toxic that we're creating in, in circuits, um, don't, they doesn't have to be. There's work into flexible biodegradable circuits using things like um, magnesium and uh, silk and different, different ways to create conductivity and things that are biodegradable, things that are rehealable, recyclable, a lot of amazing research on this space that will go onto the body. Um, and again, it, moving on to the body, this is um, an interactive temporary tattoo um, that can control your devices, et cetera. Um, and lastly, the uh, use of actual um, a tattoo ink that works as a biometric sensor. So it literally changes color when it senses things in, that's going on inside your blood chemistry. So make your tattoos work for you, right? <laughs> and, and you can uh, plug things into them. So, Last point is really to talk about with fashion and tech, language and communication. And this is a, a really big part of what this conference is about. And what we do at the Future Tech Lab is really try to present science in the language of fashion, in the aesthetic language, um, and, and to really try to bridge, bridge, build those bridges in communication and culture. So coming to the fashion industry with science is our opening party um, last year at the Google Arts and Creative Center, but during Paris Fashion Week. So you know it was like really trying to cross that over. Um, and how we are structured as a disruptive model in itself to have all these things in one company going on simultaneously to work with big brands through agency, in an agency contract model, but also have investments in startups and try to pull everyone along together with the risk mitigation, et cetera. Um, so a couple last things. This is a snapshot of where I have been. This is my schedule January to right now or June or something of this year. But the point of this is outside of outing myself for having a terrible carbon footprint for all the flights, um, so I better make these changes happen in the materials. Um, but basically, what's amazing about all these conferences is how few people cross over. So, you know, I, literally I was at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit and then I flew directly to Atlanta to Tech Tech Steel, so talking tons about sustainable textiles and innovation in the space and systems, and then I go to the most technical fabrics conference and there's not a single person overlap. But the, I mean, there wasn't anybody. And so I think that one of the things I also want to talk about with the industry is how do we reach across the aisle? So I mean, you know, maybe you don't want to go all the way to CES, but I think that there is um, a lot more conversations that need to have kind of up and down the chain of, of where we're at inside this. So thank you very much. Second. Thanks.